Hello and welcome to this webinar. We would love to know where you're coming from, geographically, institutionally, disciplinarily. Um, so feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, if you do so, please do so to all panelists and attendees. So you might make connections with other Blackboard uh, customers um, across the world. I should say I'm Jeremy Dean in Austin, Texas. So I'll wave to our Armando there in San Antonio. Um, it's awesome to see this uh, geographic diversity. Um, really, really cool. Uh, let's ask another question. I'm curious why you're here. Um, you're obviously a Blackboard customer. This is focused on uh, using our tool, Hypothesis and Blackboard. What, what made you interested in coming to uh, our webinar on social annotation? I see people saying enhance class discussion, collaboration. So exciting, 125 participants. I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I see some familiar uh, folks in the, in the chat. That's also exciting. Hi, Clark, hi, Laura. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Dr. Jeremy Dean from Hypothesis, Vice President of Education. Uh, there is a bit.ly link for this deck which I'll go ahead and drop in the chat. Um, you can take the deck and run with it. It actually does have linkable resources within uh, to help you get started uh, teaching your students annotation, uh, working with students in annotation and specifically within Blackboard. So you can turn around from this webinar and hopefully if your school has a Black Hypothesis installed in Blackboard, you can get right down to work. Um, I do see some folks from some of the schools that are piloting with us, Alabama, UDC um, and others. Uh, so welcome. This is going to be a very basic introduction to uh, the hypothesis tool and the pedagogy behind it um, and how to use it in Blackboard. Um, if you're interested in moving on from there, whether you're piloting or not, we can uh, schedule more customized webinars to dig deeper into the pedagogy of how uh, to apply social annotation in a particular discipline or at your particular school. Um, and this can also be the first step in uh, turning around and launching a pilot at your school. So you can reach out to Education at Hypothesis after uh, this webinar. If you don't already have Hypothesis at your school and are interested in uh, getting it added to, to Blackboard um, and starting a pilot with us. Um, I'm an English professor by training. Uh, I taught high school English for many years uh, and college English. Um, annotation was always super important to me as a teacher. It, it had been uh, as a student. I knew it was part of my success and I believe that annotation would be part of uh, the success of, of my students in my course. And so I always encouraged it. Um, and, uh, you know, when started to deliver books more online, uh, sort of felt like I had lost this critical piece of how my, uh, students engaged with the content for my course. Um, and when I discovered social annotation, I really felt a, a sigh of relief in a sense of, um, uh, finding a tool that would allow me to continue an analog practice, uh, with some sort of new and exciting affordances. Um, as Blackboard users and, and Blackboard has known for many years, you know, Blackboard has been in the business of creating online spaces uh, for, for education, um, online spaces for students and instructors and students and students to engage with each other uh, and with content. You know, Blackboard is one of the original sort of innovators in that space. Um, and as folks have moved more online in the, in, the, in the recent months due to the pandemic, but even before that, as we've tried to sort of bridge the gap between class meeting and class meeting and and enrich those spaces with uh, engagement with our courses. You know, we look for tools that help us build community. Uh, we look for tools that help us build uh, interaction. Um, and I believe social annotation and the margins of digital documents is one of the most powerful places to, um, to do so. Uh, this is a quote I like to begin with. Online, a book can be a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions in conversation. That's from about eight years ago when this technology really started taking off social annotation uh, and social reading. Um, and I think it's important for us to think about, especially in the pandemic moment, how do we create spaces for teaching and learning, especially when we can't meet face to face? Um, I think that's a question before the pandemic as well, um, but we wanna find authentic engaging spaces for our students to engage with each other, with us and with content. Um, and today we'll be talking about the margin of digital documents as that kind of place. I'm gonna share three top level takeaways uh, that I've gathered from students and instructors that I've worked with over the years 
uh, in implementing social annotation in their classrooms. And then we're going to get down to the practical, and I'll show you how this works in Blackboard. The first is that hypothesis makes reading active, uh, or social annotation makes reading active. And this is what annotation has always done. It's not anything new. If you've written in the margin of a book, you know this. You may have encouraged students to do it. Uh, writing in the margins of the books, taking notes, uh, sharing ideas there. Uh, it's a way to better comprehend material. It's a way to begin to think more critically about the material. Um, and so in a sense, this idea of making reading active is nothing new, although of course, in a lot of digital documents, we don't have a margin. There is no place to write. And so hypothesis is you know, re-enabling the margin as a place for students and instructors to engage uh, with content. One of the neat things about when we take annotation online into digital and social uh, environments is uh, is that um, you know we can have multimedia uh, elements in our annotations and so here's an example of uh, Larry Hanley at San Francisco State having students annotate a poem with images the degree to which um, you want to have students working with images working with video working with inter uh, with uh, with hyperlinks in annotations is, is really up to you um, uh, but it's it's a power, and I'll, I'll show you how that works in just a little bit. It's a new way for students to engage. It's a new way to show their expertise. Hypothesis makes reading visible. This really was what was sort of radically new to me when I discovered social annotation. I'd always encouraged uh, students to annotate. I obviously wanted them to engage with the content of my course, um, but I evaluated that engagement largely on the basis of final products, you know, in a composition or an English class, a, a paper that they wrote. Um, so I engage them really at the end of a long process of a lot of formative moments and uh, formative uh, areas where they were deploying their skills. Um, and I just created the final product. And the neat thing about social annotation is it makes all those micro processes that might lead to a summative assessment more visible and addressable. I can see whether a student has done the reading. I can see if they're confused about a certain concept and I can intervene. I can see if they have a particularly rich line of inquiry that I want to nurture and help, you know, uh, help them come up with ideas maybe for a more summative assignment, uh, push them in the right direction to find other resources. Um, making all that visible is very powerful and allows us as teachers, I think, to engage with students um, in new ways with, our, with, uh, with, with them uh, around the work they do for our, our courses. And then thirdly, hypothesis makes reading uh, social. Uh, this is the, the piece of social annotation that the students really uh, latch on to, um, the idea that they're no longer alone in their reading. I think it's wonderful as an English professor. I loved having, you know, thinking about my students getting lost in the books that I assigned. Um, I think that's still important. I don't want to displace it. Um, but it also can be very lonely <laughs> uh, as you enter college and are reading more difficult content um, or advance in a, in a discipline and read more and more difficult content. I know I had this experience in grad school feeling like an imposter, like I didn't belong there. I didn't understand things. I sort of felt like, well, maybe I shouldn't be here. Um, but that's sort of part of the experience. That's what, uh, frankly, reading is about sometimes, that kind of disorientation. Um, and it's helpful to know that others are struggling. And it's helpful to be able to work with others to make meaning on top of texts. Um, and that's you know, what students say. That's not just me waxing poetic on, as an English professor, but um, this is a great quote from a student at, uh, at Plymouth State several years ago. Uh, she wrote in a blog actually about her experience of hypothesis in the classroom. Hypothesis is my literary Facebook. When I'm reading, I sometimes wonder, does anyone actually understand this? Am I crazy? With this brilliant tool, I know I'm not alone. So let's get into the practical. And again, I encourage you to ask questions uh, or just you know, cheer from the sidelines there in the chat. Uh, do remember to post to all panelists and attendees, uh, not just to all panelists, unless of course you have direct feedback for me and my team uh, and you don't want others to see it, uh, but more likely let's keep this open and, and uh, horizontal and, and include all panelists and attendees in your, in your comments and questions and do ask questions. We've got a team standing by to respond. And uh, also you may be asking a question that's relevant to others um, and we'll surface it and have a conversation about it. Before I move on, actually, if you've used hypothesis in the classroom, because I know there's some of you out there and you're interested in being unmuted or interested in sharing in the chat, something besides the three takeaways uh, I've already shared, this is one opportunity to do so. I'm gonna 
take a, a sip of water and pause, take a teacherly pause to see if anybody wants to participate. I know that's a big ask. We've got 146 people here. Any existing users of Hypothesis want to share a use case or share a takeaway they've had? All right, I'm going to just take that as I basically captured it all in my three points there. Um, but let's talk about uh, the practical here. Um, when Hypothesis is active on a document, uh, you can select text to annotate. And you can reply to existing annotations. And sorry, it looks like I, uh, um, I, sh I, I spoke too soon. It looks like some folks are sharing in the chat some of their experiences. Um, you can reply to existing annotations. Uh, it's true that not all annotation activities need to be discursive, uh, need to be about conversation, although I think that's one of the major powers of the tool. Um, but if you do, if, this, if, the, if discussion is a goal for you, um, then you know, noting the reply feature, building the reply feature into your uh, assignments and exercises um, is, uh, is important to, to note. And then this is the first of a couple slides that has some practical guides for you that you can take away from here. Um, I know some folks here are already piloting Hypothesis in Blackboard at their institutions. Um, and so Hypothesis is already there for you in Blackboard. Um, others may be newer to Hypothesis. Their institutions may not yet have uh, launched a pilot. We can talk about that. You can reach out to Education at Hypothesis and we'll help uh, guide you through the process of launching a pilot at your institution and getting Hypothesis in your course so you can do what I'm about to show. Um, but this set of resources on slide 12 are just some very basic introductions to annotation, actually irregardless of your LMS. Um, things like, you know, guides for students about you know, how to be a thoughtful annotator, to select text carefully, to be additive. These aren't actually meant to be prescriptions um, because you may have different uses for hypothesis that um, they require different types of annotation. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a use case for a one-off annotation that doesn't encourage discussion. For example, drilling paraphrase. I've known instructors use hypothesis to really train paraphrase. Probably not gonna lead to a lengthy discussion thread um, but a very you know, sensible way of using the tool to visualize here's some text and here's how I've paraphrased that without plagiarizing for students new to academic writing. Um, that can be very powerful. So these are meant to be rules, take them or leave them as you see fit. Um, one of the guides here is for adding images, video and links in your annotations. Uh, again, not everybody will find it useful or, 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 or valuable to, you know, uh, make annotations more multimedia, kind of depends on your teaching goals, your discipline, um, but the, to the extent that linking to other resources within an annotation, you think it's something valuable for a student to do, or adding images to annotations uh, would help them think about multimodal composition or something like that, um, those uh, affordances are at your fingertips with uh, the hypothesis tool. And so now to the blackboard of it all. Um, we have a Blackboard integration. It's a basic LTI application. Um, if you're already piloting, you may know this. Uh, it can be installed in Blackboard and then ready for instructors in their courses. For some of you that are not yet piloting Hypothesis, there's probably a process to go through to work with us and your LMS administrator to get Hypothesis installed in your class uh, so that you can use it. But once it's there, it's quite easy to use. Um, there's no signing up for anything. Uh, essentially what you're able to do is configure hypothesis to appear on readings and essentially to make your readings for your course annotatable. So we have single sign-on, as I mentioned. And the other uh, uh, neat thing about the Blackboard integration is that there's a gradebook integration. Uh, so not only can you make your, um, your um, readings annotatable, um, but you can, uh, you can also assess student contributions. And then uh, there are some resources on slide 17 that link to, if you already have Hypothesis installed, how to uh, set up readings uh, in Blackboard. I've popped out of slideshow mode uh, in order to jump over to, to, uh, to Blackboard and demo there. But when I come back to, um, to, to the slide deck, I will, uh, I will go to slide view presentation mode.
Any questions at this point? So I'm about to share the Blackboard of it all. I'm in a pretty bare bones Blackboard course here. Actually, we just migrated our Blackboard instance. And so there's not a lot here uh, to make it look like a, a live course. Um, but I am going to be able to show you what a Hypothesis looks like in a Blackboard course. I'm in a course right now called Literature 404. And Hypothesis lives in the content area. And I will actually make this a little uh, bigger. So Hypothesis lives in the content area. Um, I'll come back to this, but um, you know what? I need to log out and not be student first. Um, so let me do that real quick. And hopefully this works. Uh, so now I'm back in the, uh, as, as a teacher here. Um, I'm back in Literature 404. Um, and I go to the content area. That is where. Um, uh, hypothesis lives inside of content, um, and I can add more content using the build content, but I'm not going to go there first. Let's start off in a poem uh, by Mary Oliver called Wild Geese. As I mentioned, I'm an English professor by training, um, and we'll open up a hypothesis reading, and here is what it looks like. Um, you have a reading on the left here. In this case, it's a poem by Mary Oliver, Wild Geese, and over here is hypothesis, this little sidebar that can pop in and out. I can scroll through it. You can see that several students have annotated already um, on top of a uh, hypothesis enabled reading. I can select text. And when I select text, I'm given two options. I can highlight, which is a private act. Highlights are only for me. Um, or I can annotate. Um, and when I annotate, you see a uh, annotation pane opens up. Um, and it's really open ended. Uh, I think. You know, we, we really try, strive to be as pedagogically neutral as possible around how annotation gets used in your classroom. As I mentioned, some folks might use it to train students to paraphrase. Others might be training students to, um, to you know, to, uh, use certain critical frameworks um, in an advanced course in a discipline. Um, you can leverage the annotation tool in the annotation space, however you see fit to try to uh, direct students in terms of th their reading strategies. Um, and it's really just a, a, a text entry space, right? I can type text, I can format that text, uh, I can add a hyperlink to another uh, resource, maybe cite something that I mentioned in my annotation. Uh, if there's another poem or that kind of has a line that's similar to that, maybe I link to that poem. Um, in this case, I can add an image. Um, I can use latex. I didn't see anybody uh, suggest that they were from a mathematical discipline but latex is a way to write math equations, so I can incorporate that into annotations. I can also drop a YouTube video, um, and I can tag annotations if I want my students to um, sort of structure their annotations in some way. Um, so for example, with a poetry assignment, I might have students look for uh, you know, imagery, metaphor, and illusion, um, and have them use those as tags so that they're thinking about those different poetic elements, and then also that we can filter the text for those poetic elements uh, when we meet synchronously um, and we might focus in on one of those elements and, and, and talk about that. And it also becomes in handy in the gradebook integration as well. Um, so again, an annotation is just, you know, my username. I'm Professor Oak here. Uh, the referent, what I selected from, um, from, the, from the text, and then my comment on that referent. Um, and I can tag it uh, as well. I'm going to stop there. Um, and there are a lot of questions in the chat that I haven't been able to totally follow. Um, but maybe my colleagues can help me surface any that might be worth mentioning now, just in terms of some of the basic functionality of the interface that we're looking at. And I will be getting on to the gradebook integration, uh, as well as uh, how to create one of these activities. Marianne, I'm going to come back and show you how to create this uh, a poem, you know, and, and uh, add, add an assignment like this. Right now, I just kind of want to look at, like, you know, when hypothesis is active on a text, what does it look like? What am I able to do? What am I not able to do? Let me open up another one. This is Amanda Gorman's poem from uh, the recent inauguration. This one's a PDF. Um, so this, this uh, assignment was generated by using a PDF. 
Um, and then the other assignment, the Mary Oliver poem was generated using a, a URL or web address for that document. Uh, I'll show you in the workflow in a second, but there are essentially two options when you're adding uh, hypothesis activity in terms of where does the content live and what format is it in. It can either be a web page, a publicly available web page with a URL, or it can be a PDF. Susan asked if this would work with Kindle um, and some other things like that. Uh, we don't yet work with Kindle. You know, Kindle's very locked down being, you know, an Amazon product. Um, not a lot of other tools can, can play in the Amazon ecosystem or, or the King Kindle ecosystem, although it would certainly be a, a dream of ours in the future to be able to provide social annotation um, inside of Kindle and on that type of format of ebook as well as other places. So let's go ahead and uh, show you how to create one of these. I'm going to go back to my content area. And I will say that, you know, hopefully this looks a little familiar to you. I'm in Blackboard Learn right now. Uh, I know Blackboard has other products or sort of versions of their LMS. Uh, this, does, this tool does work in Blackboard Ultra as well. The, the pathways to make the things happen are slightly different, but ultimately you get to the same place, a reading that can be annotated. So I'm in the content area and I'm gonna to go to build content and my friendly neighborhood LMS administrator um, has uh, installed Hypothesis for me. So I just click on Hypothesis and I have a, uh, a little, uh, you know, you've probably seen this before. I can type in a uh, uh, title for this exercise. I could, you know, put an assignment prompt up here in the description. I don't use this attachment section. That is not how uh, I connect a reading to hypothesis. Um, I make a choice here about grading. I have the option of making it gradable or not. Um, and that's really up to you pedagogically. Do you want to be able to assess individual student contributions, uh, which I actually forgot to show and I will, um, or do you really just want this to be low stakes or no stakes or grade it, but not leverage a sort of gradebook integration? Um, so I'm not gonna make this gradable and I'll click submit and I have to reopen it. And this is an important place. I see a lot of questions uh, in the chat about this. This is an important place to stop because this is where you're going to stitch hypothesis annotation to a document, to a reading for your course. And as I said earlier, there are two options. I can either grab a URL from a public web page. Yikes, I don't know what's going on there. Um, a URL from a public web page like that Mary Oliver poem, or I can select a PDF. Right now, that PDF would have to live in an associated Google Drive. Um, but we are, before the end of the spring, going to be able to deliver uh, Blackboard file integration or Blackboard content integration. So there would be a third button here. And if I have PDF files that are sort of inside my course, I'll be able to point to them there. One of the unique things about Hypothesis is that we don't host text. We don't host content. Uh, our focus is to build a tool that moves between content in different formats in different locations. Um, and so we'll be building out this menu here. Right now it's a uh, URL for a public website and PDF from Google Drive. Very soon there'll be PDF from Blackboard content. Um, and then we might have you know, Microsoft OneDrive integration. Uh, we plan to have partnerships with the library resources like the eRes providers and the EBSCOs and JSTORs of the world. So you might be able to go to your EBSCO shelf and grab something directly from uh, the library that way. Um, but for now, to be absolutely clear uh, for Christina and others, um, the workflow is to download PDF from its location, uh, upload it into, Black, uh, into Google Drive. Let me just quickly show you that real quick, actually. I'm gonna click on PDF from Google Drive and uh, you may or may not be seeing me actually authenticate here. And while I'm saying that, I, uh, showing this, I'll, I will answer Karen in, in the chat. The PDF from Blackboard content is a top priority. I think it's about three quarters done from a development standpoint. So it's probably gonna be launched within the spring term, but certainly be ready by summer. To access PDFs, and yikes, yeah, what's happening here? Um, to access PDFs, yeah, they have to be in a Google Drive folder. And then soon they'll be able to be in Blackboard content um, and other locations as well. 
I may be having some issue with the connectivity of my instance of Blackboard with uh, Google. So that may be something I need to check on. Oh, no, here it comes. Um, so I authenticated into a Google account. And then I'm now seeing PDFs that are in my Google Drive. And so Patrick asks above, I don't need to use Google Drive. I can upload from a local folder. Um, I think that was a, I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment, but I'm going to address it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I am using Google here. And I personally have a Google account. So I, I have some PDFs in my uh, Google Drive already. But I can just use Google as a pathway to look inside my device. And I can grab a PDF here. Um, so I do need to have a login to Google um, currently to access PDFs within Blackboard uh, and, and with Hypothesis. Um, but I don't need to preload everything into that Google Drive and have all the, the things that I might want students to read there. Um, I can you know, look inside my device, uh, but I am kind of peeking through Google to get to uh, my device, if that makes sense. Um, so I could grab a PDF from there. Um, I can also grab a PDF that exists in Google Drive. Here's that Maya Angelou uh, thing that I was looking for. And we'll see the Maya Angelou story uh, essay pop up. And um, it's now annotatable in the course. And then, of course, the other option, as I mentioned, is to, uh, to um, use a, a, a web address. Um, and I forget what it was going to be. It's like Lincoln first inaugural, maybe, um, or Lincoln 1861 inaugural. Um, so now this time, I'm going to show you a different workflow. Maybe this time, I'll make it graded and um, make it out of 10. And I'll submit this one. And I'll show you the other workflow. Again, I have to go back to the shell of the assignment and I'll go through the URL process here. Um, I guess I have to go find it. So you'll be with me from the start. This uh, Constitution Center, how about that one? Does that look like a good digital version of the speech? So here I have a Bartleby.com link, and I'll come back to uh, where I was in Blackboard. Yikes. I don't know if others are seeing that, but I'm getting like some tremors. Um, and there's, there it is, um, the, the speech, and uh, got this, um, you know, the annotation sidebar here. Um, and this is a graded one, so you can see this grade, this grade book view. Let me go back to, um, to the Mary Oliver poem um, to show you the gradebook view real quick. And I know there was a question about searching a document. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and show that real quick. Actually, I think I can do it on Amanda Gorman. Um, all right, so uh, a couple things to show here. One, um, somebody asked in the chat about searching the sidebar. Um, so as I mentioned before, you can use tags. You can see actually on this assignment, the instructor has asked the students to use tags. Um, and so I can search the sidebar. I can search the hypothesis annotations really for anything. Um, but maybe there's a particular tag I asked students to annotate with and to be mindful of as they were annotating, like diction for this poetry analysis. So I can search diction in the sidebar and it'll just show me the diction annotations. Not super dramatic right now, but if you can imagine a group of students all using a, uh, several different tags, uh, you might get a handful of diction tags. And then in class, um, you'd be able to pull up, you know, basically uh, um, filter the text for that tag um, and then talk about diction. <laughs> Does everybody understand what diction means? How is Amanda Gorman using diction? Uh, how about some people, you know, uh, model student, tell us a little bit about the passage that you chose to represent an example of diction. Um, so I can filter the text in that way. Um, I can also uh, go into a gradebook view. Um, this allows me, up here you can see our gradebook uh, tool. Um, and what this allows me to do, it looks like, yeah, so this only has two students again, it won't be super dramatic. 
um, but there's a bunch of annotations on the text, right? Um, but with the gradebook view, I can toggle through students. There's only two here, um, but I can toggle to model student. And now it's just showing me her three annotations and I can send a grade to the gradebook right up here. She gets a 10 out of 10 because she did all three annotations. So I'll submit that. And I can go back and I can see class clown uh, just did two annotations. This one's really just an image. So that didn't follow my assignment. So I'm gonna give him a seven out of seven. Oops, that's not what I did um, up here. So I'm sending the grade to the gradebook there. And if we, if we switched over to the gradebook, we'd go and see a line item for this assignment and see, see the grades I've entered. All right, I am going to stop there um, and ask my colleagues or others, uh, see, see what the, the, tag, uh, the chat says um, uh, about what kind of questions have come up. Jeremy, it might be great to talk about some ideas for ways to use this with groups. Questions are coming up in the chat about groups with hypothesis. Thanks, Becky. Um, so uh, we are working to be able to listen to the Blackboard concept of groups. You know, you can create a group in Blackboard. Right now, hypothesis as a tool isn't, you know, doesn't know that. Uh, it just knows the course roster. It doesn't know those subdivisions. Very soon, we're going to have that direct group uh, integration. Um, for now, what you would have to do is create multiple versions of a document um, to essentially sort of trick hypothesis and use groups in that way. Because otherwise, hypothesis will throw all annotations on Amanda Gorman, um, Amanda Gorman's poem, all on every version of Amanda Gorman that appears in your course. But if you actually create a sort of pretend different version of, uh, of Amanda Gorman's poem, um, then hypothesis will just think of them as two different documents. And we've actually developed a tool that allows you to do this. Um, you can thank me later for introducing you to the uh, concept of a PDF fingerprint, um, but actually every PDF has a distinct number uh, that makes it unique. Um, and that's what hypothesis triangulates on. So it knows to connect the right group of people on the PDF. And you essentially have to change that code. And we have a PDF fingerprinter that allows you to drag a PDF here. So I could drag that Amanda Gorman, Amanda Gorman poem here. And if I had a class of 20 and I wanted four groups of five, I could generate four copies of it with those different uh, fingerprints. Um, you have to tell me how I did there, Becky. It's, it's hard to explain groups sometimes. I think you might be able to do a better job than I. Um, but here's our no, fingerprint. That, that was great. <laughs> Other questions or, uh, or comments? Another thing while we're, uh, yeah, so I'll drop this into the chat, this tool um, for the finger printer. Um, while we're on the topic of PDFs, another um, important piece of, um, of PDF uh, uh, knowledge um, is that some PDFs are accessible and some PDFs uh, are not. And what that means is that some PDFs are just an image and other PDFs actually have text inscribed on top of uh, uh, on top of the image, and I already see Patrick and others um, commenting on this. Right, the kind of technical way to talk about that is some PDFs are OCR; they have optical character recognition. They have optical characters that a computer can read and see on top of them. You probably have experienced this as a, as an academic, where you have a PDF, you try to copy and paste text, your cursor just bounces off. It's just an image. Other PDFs, probably more modern PDFs, produced by a journal or something like that. Uh, you can select PD, uh, text just like you can on a website and copy and paste it. So those scans that are years old that were scanned or Xeroxed from a book and then turned into a PDF, unlikely that they have that layer of text on top of them and they'd need to be run through a secondary process called optical character recognition. There's a lot of tools online to do that. Adobe Acrobat Pro, not free, um, is uh, one of the best, but your friendly folks at Hypothesis have actually developed a little tool that um, OCRs or makes uh, uh, PDFs accessible. So if you have one of those PDFs, it's just an image, you can drag it in here and it will spit back out an OCR or accessible version of that. I say accessible because this is actually the same uh, technology required for a PDF to be read 
uh, to a student who um, is, uh, you know, uh, needs a screen reader to, to be able to, to, to hear a text. Um, so it's actually pretty good practice regardless of annotation. Um, so you can drag a PDF here, OCR it, and then drag a PDF here, make a few versions of it, and then create some assignments in Blackboard um, around uh, that PDF. So um, let's go back and finish out the presentation. I'll, I'll just actually pause real quick and take my last sip of water here um, and just see if uh, my colleagues or anybody in the chat wants to surface a question that uh, I've missed. One thing I, I just noticed that I forgot here um, is uh, there's a difference between annotations, which are, um, you know, attached to specific text within a document, and then page notes, as we call them, which are document level uh, comments. Really, they should be called document notes. Um, so a page note is something that's not attached to a specific referent within the text, but is kind of a, a global statement about the text. And so you can see here that the professor thought that would be a good place to drop the YouTube of Amanda reading this poem. Um, could be a good place to, to throw a prompt for an assignment. Could be a good place to um, maybe do a little background on a text if you're reading a new short story and you wanna give a little bio of the author. It's essentially like a head note in an anthology. Um, that's where you could surface the tags you want students to use. A lot of different options for using um, uh, the page note feature. All right, uh, I'm gonna share just a few sort of provocations, if you will, to try to inspire you to think about how you could use this in, the uh, in, in a class. Um, and I'll go back to uh, slide mode. Um, six ways to annotate for and with students. The first is just a reminder, although I'm an English geek um, and all about reading and annotating and writing, um, this isn't really just about literacy. Uh, it's also about community. Um, you know, we're all searching for, especially during the pandemic, but I think even before authentic ways to engage with each other uh, online. Um, and, and this is a, a, an authentic way to engage with others online, social annotation. Um, and I, I often hear feedback from instructors that aren't about this made my students do the reading or made my students better readers, but just like this brought us together. This, uh, this made us better, a better community, helped us be more collaborative in other ways outside of the margins. Um, a neat thing to start with if you haven't started your semester is to annotate the syllabus with your students or invite your students to annotate the syllabus. It's a low stakes way to start using the tool. Uh, they can get to know the course. You can get some feedback. Um, you could ask something like, what's exciting about this course and what's making you nervous? Um, and you get to know them a little bit. They get to know the course. You might even get some feedback and, uh, and update your syllabus accordingly. Um, this can be done with any ancillary uh, documents for a course, right? Not just a syllabus. So it could be an essay assignment. Students could ask questions uh, on top of the essay assignment um, or share early ideas. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, a lot of times when we're reading online, we lose the margin uh, as a place to practice this age old tradition of, of, of annotation. Um, and so you can just use hypothesis to give students back the margin in the digital uh, reading space. Um, you can just turn it on and see how they use it. Maybe they use it for private annotation. Maybe they kind of just form their own little study groups. Um, I think it's most powerfully used when, uh, when there's some guidance or some direction. Um, here, uh, I'm su the suggestion is, you know, the, the teacher do the annotating. Uh, you can pre-populate a text with signposts to guide students through a difficult reading. Uh, you could pre-populate with questions. I think there was some murmuring above about the discussion forum. Um, you know, I think it's the first discussion forum I ever used was in Blackboard, and it's the first thing I ever went to as a digital tool because I was like, oh, neat, my students could engage with each other before class, won't class be a lot better? Uh, and I think it did that. It was better than uh, what I had before, which was nothing. Um, but I think it's true that the discussion forum really isn't all that discursive in the end, um, and we're looking for better ways to engage students with each other and with content. And why not move that discussion on top of the text where it can be grounded in your course material, uh, where it doesn't have to be teacher directed, teacher asks a question, students respond, but it can be more distributed. Students might spark a deep threaded conversation uh, that ends up doing better work than any discussion form prompt uh, could do. Um, 
the bread and butter of what we do really though is asynchronous seminar style discussion. Um, this can be open-ended. I want three annotations for Monday. It can be more directed. I want one question, one uh, reply, and uh, one statement. Or I want uh, you to try to find these five poetic elements and say something about it, about each of them. Um, we have lots of ideas about how to use hypothesis in the classroom and to nurture uh, discussion um, and deeper, closer reading. Uh, this is just meant to be an introduction, but if your school is piloting or you launch a pilot at your school, we can follow this up with something more customized for specific disciplines or really more for, focused on workshopping with uh, instructors at your school, uh, hearing from them their learning goals and challenges, trying to map those to ways that hypothesis can be leveraged to address them. So this again is just meant to be a sort of introduction about the possibilities, uh, follow up with education at hypothesis to learn more and get your school started in our pilot program. Uh, and then finally, you know, and we've seen a lot of this during the pandemic uh, when people aren't able to give their lecture, sometimes they'll put up their lecture notes or their lecture script or even, um, you know, their, their a PDF of their uh, slide deck and have students annotate uh, on top of those artifacts uh, from courses uh, as well. The pilot program, um, is something that I'm very proud of. It's a very hands-on, high-touch uh, program. Um, we have hundreds of schools participating this fall, past fall and this spring. Um, obviously you have technical support uh, as a pilot school, um, but what I'm most proud of is our pedagogical support. Uh, everybody I've hired in sales, success and uh, support um, has taught before, has a background in education. Uh, knows the work that you're doing, knows the expectations that assignment needs, assignments need to work. And when something's not working on Sunday night, you need somebody to respond quickly. Can't really wait because it's, you know, students work is dependent upon it. Um, so we've been there. And I think more importantly, we understand pedagogy and we're happy to talk about um, how to use this in your particular discipline. Obviously we haven't dug that deep today, but you can actually schedule one-on-one -on -one conversations with our success team to talk about how to apply this in a in a chemistry course. Um, and in fact, I think we have uh, some, some former science teachers on staff and Becky is actually here today. Uh, we have former, former language teachers, former music teachers. I'm a former English professor. Um, so we have that. And then we also, uh, well, that, actually that's it, I guess. Education at Hypothesis uh, to learn more. Uh, we still have time for questions, um, but I'll just close by saying, um, if you're not already piloting, um, and you're interested in using Hypothesis, get in touch with us at Education at Hypothesis and we can help steward uh, you and your institution or your department uh, through the process of getting the LMS uh, tool uh, installed in your Blackboard instance um, and supporting your usage of it uh, through a pilot. Time for questions. I know there's been a lot. I'm sure Becky's been busy. I think she's uh, addressed quite a bit, but if there's stuff that uh, my hypothesis colleagues thinks, uh, think, my hypothesis colleagues think is worth mentioning aloud. Uh, feel free to unmute and let me know, or if there's folks that still have questions, um, ask them in the chat as well. Hey, Jeremy, it's Nate. <clears throat> I think you, you kind of talked about this before, but you might address again the strategy and uh, situation with um, annotating documents that are behind paywalls or in other systems like library reserves. Could you just cover that one more time? I think some people missed it. Yeah, sure thing. So today, if you turn around and use this in, uh, in a classroom, um, you can annotate with a PDF, but that PDF has to be hosted in Google Drive. So you'd be downloading it from its source and uploading it to uh, Google Drive or grabbing it from your desktop. Um, we're working with uh, the JSTORs and the EBSCOs and the vital sources of the world to build in direct connections to, um, to, uh, <clears throat> to those databases and uh, <clears throat> resources to you know, be able to annotate at the origin. Um, uh, and so that's coming in the next you know, six to eight months uh, where you'd be able to maybe go and uh, you know, create a shelf in JSTOR and then get to that shelf um, from Blackboard through Hypothesis. But for now, a permalink at JSTOR will not work. Uh, it would have to be downloaded from JSTOR and, and loaded uh, into Blackboard or to, to Google. And I think I just love what I just saw uh, Manuel talking about using hypothesis synchronously. I've really just talked about it asynchronously. I have a bias for the asynchronous use. 
Um, but it's a very flexible tool. And so, you know, a lot of times when we lead workshops for individual schools, we will do a synchronous annotation exercise with the pilot cohort, the instructors, and annotate something together. And I, I love your point, Manuel, that um, that's a neat way to get others involved in the conversation who might be shyer to speak publicly, but maybe more comfortable um, annotating, uh, having the time to write something out and then, and then sharing it. So incredibly flexible tool, learning every day, as I just did from Manuel, about new use cases. So Roberta asks more about the PDF process. Yeah, it would have to stay in that Google Drive um, folder for the uh, for it to be continually accessible. Talking about PDFs again. Donna has asked this question a few times and I'm perplexed by it. Um, can you change a URL after you add it? Um, so part of what hypo I think the answer is just simply no, but I'm sort of confused by the question. Um, feel free to unmute Donna or raise your hand. I can, if there's more to be said, but hypothesis needs a canonical location to triangulate people on top of a document, right? With a web page, that's the URL. Uh, and if the URL changes, then the whole, you know, the bridge collapses. Um, so we need that URL. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly why you'd want to change it. Um, if you wanna do a new document, a new URL, you just create a new assignment. Um, but feel free to reach out, Don, if I'm sure I'm, I've not properly answered the question about the URL. So again, you're welcome to, um, okay, they, if an instructor puts in one in there, that's a mistake. Um, I mean, I think if you just replace it with the correct URL, Becky or somebody else might be able to better an, uh, answer this. Uh, you can just correct it. Um, and then that new URL will be the one that, that's used. I mean, the, the, the error URL will just break. Yeah, quick shout out to our support team. Um, they're very uh, quick to respond. I think that's one thing we don't hear from uh, customers that our support team is not uh, there when they need them. Um, so if you're feeling left high and dry by any other ed tech tools, come into the family. We're, we're, we're here for you and we're, uh, we're friendly and we're high touch and hands-on. Roberta asked a specific question about the grade book. Um, can we have a score above 10? Um, so when you create assignment in Blackboard, you can give it whatever point value you want. Um, in the hypothesis interface for now, it says out of 10. But if you made it out of 100 and you gave a nine out of 10, somebody does the math. I don't know if it's hypothesis or Blackboard, but it ends up being a 90 uh, in your grade book. Um, so uh, you can, you, you tell it what you want it to be out of to Blackboard in the Blackboard uh, assignment or content creation workflow. Um, and then hypothesis just translates that for you into whatever uh, number it is you chose. So it can be more than 10, yeah. Um, I don't know the answer to rubrics, but I did see above in the chat that's moving so fast um, that uh, somebody uses the attachment piece of the assignment workflow to add the rubric. Well, this has been great, folks. I wanna thank Blackboard for working with us on this webinar. Um, they've been great partners um, and it's the longest standing uh, uh, LMS that I've ever worked in. Um, so I'm coming full circle to my days as a grad student and first leveraging the discussion forum as part of courses I taught at University of Texas uh, back when they were a Blackboard customer. Um, and thankful uh, for, for their team, uh, both in marketing and uh, in development for helping us uh, get this tool and, and uh, up and running and, and get the word out to the Blackboard community. Uh, please be in touch with us at Education at Hypothesis uh, about really anything at all in terms of uh, next steps. Um, but especially in terms of getting it going for you in Blackboard at your institution uh, and hopefully uh, launching a pilot with us and continuing to work more closely around um, the pedagogy of social annotation. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Hypothesis team.